And here we are. Hey everyone, this session is brought to you by Alcogel, the world's uh, leading uh, hand sanitizer as uh, Gabby showed off. I'm good for Alcogel. I got toilet paper, I've got Alcogel, I got pasta, I got tuna. I'm gonna survive this thing. The entire zombie apocalypse included? No, just the first part when everybody gets sick. After everybody turns to uh, zombies, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a shotgun. I don't, uh, no, I'm, 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 gonna the the first, I'm gonna be the first ones that are dead. I don't, I don't own a chainsaw, man. <laughs> so I think everybody is joining in. Uh, I've shared the first kind of poll to see where everybody's located uh, inside their nuclear bunker or, or where they're at. Curious to know that. I'm currently in a bunker in a side room here at my parents' house. That's the quietest place I could find without my kids, uh, you know, barging in uh, through the door. I'm in an undisclosed location. I'm not <laughs> going to say where. I actually, uh, I, I managed to get into um, my, my co-working space, which is literally in the, uh, in the same building where my apartment is. So I have a back entrance. <laughs> so there's like nobody here. There's like two people and a dog. I think the dog has Corona though. So I see most people have an, a home office. That's mm -hmm. nice. The people are organized. It must be nice to have a home office. I must say, I must say. Do I think that when they when they say home office, do they really just mean the kids' room? Most probably, yes. <laughs> Some kids not doing their homework, their remote homework now, because their dad is the, or mom is in their room, you know, listening to a, to a webinar. So just a couple more minutes, and it will start off. I see people are joining in as we speak. Hey, Noah. Hey, it's Guy Rosman. What's up, Guy? Dva from LinkedIn is here. Gee, we got some celebrities. Random home, we done. Random home. <laughs> so, have you been? Uh, have you been surviving these days? Uh, I, I've been holding off from from stacking all these kind of uh, toiletry and. Uh, you know, all these different uh, food uh, alternatives uh, at home. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm going to break soon. You got to break. Man, toilet paper. Man needs toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> like, whatever. Take my food. Take the aqua gel. Just toilet paper. If I can't wipe like a man, that's when I lose it. That's when, that's it. That's when you're, you're officially I'm completely like you're not Noah. a person anymore. I'm completely with Noah. I, I have about four pounds of uh, tahini stacked up at home. I think that's pretty much the only thing that I have prepared in advance. Zombies come, I can shoot them uh, tahini uh, <laughs> spoons. <laughs> isn't, <laughs> isn't, that how, isn't that how you win the zombie apocalypse with tahini? <laughs> I think that, that's my only chance uh, currently, currently, yeah. Nice. Uh, well, I think uh, we'll start off in the... Get this uh, show on the road. It was this lovely uh, uh, front uh, kind of slide there. Uh, me, of course, being taller than Ga Gabriel. Yeah. Guys, this is complete fiction. In real life, I'm at least a meter or two uh, taller than Elad. Um, Fake news. Fake news. Yeah. Uh, it's totally uh, doctored uh, photo. Yeah. So uh, happy we can start off this uh, first episode of Digital Pandemic. Uh, may to come, as long as this uh, pandemic uh, strives and uh, continues. Uh, hopefully, it will end uh, sooner rather than later, but while it's around, uh, we'll be happy to kind of share our thoughts and insights from trying to manage campaigns and, in general, kind of digital advertising within these crazy days. Uh, yeah, I, I think Vlad and I have an in interesting perspective uh, I'm sure other other guys here do as well, but um, both we, we work with a lot of different clients in a lot of different sectors, and we see a lot of different data. And so um, when whenever we talk, uh, you know, usually when things are going on in the world, Elad is one of the first people I, I reach out to say, okay, what are you seeing? Um, and, and 
So it's uh, it's usually an interesting conversation. So we thought it might be interesting to share that conversation with you guys. Hopefully, hopefully it will be. And, and since not everyone knows you, I'd be happy if you'd share a word or two about yourself. Uh, so yeah, I'm. Uh, my name is Gabriel Ehrlich. Uh, I'm the founder of a little agency called Remotion. Remotion is. Uh, uh, B2B digital agency uh, specializing in LinkedIn advertising. Been around for almost four years now. Can you believe it? Um, yeah, that's that's what we do. We help B2B clients, uh, B2B software companies get lead generation, get leads in um, into the pipeline. And obviously, different people have been experiencing different things right now. So, yeah. Cool. And I've actually known Gabby for the past, I believe, five years now, uh, working together at K-Logic at the uh, digital marketing agency back in the day. Uh, myself coming from background of web analytics, uh, SEO, marketing automation, these are kind of the foundations that I grew on and now working at Fixel, handling everything marketing and product there. Uh, so that's my day job uh, for now until the zombie apocalypse uh, arrives at least. And so, so these are the different perspectives we'll try to, to kind of share along this episode. Uh, and with us joining on later, we'll have also Ritsik al uh, who besides being my brother-in-law is also a, a doctor who uh, actually is, is uh, specializing in social psychology. So we'll share his angle of things and how people are coping with this specific crisis and how we as advertisers, marketers, uh, can really try to be more empathetic and, and really approach these people uh, in a better way. So without further ado, let's uh, let's start talking about marketing during a pandemic, during this crazy kind of crisis that's happening out there. And so I think my first take was really kind of trying to take a step back, Gabby, and understanding where do we stand at? What what are the, the things that we can actually see that are happening, and, and what are the, the the facts within all that kind of crazy uh, behavior that's happening? And, and and I think we can say quite clearly that we know who, who the big losers are, right? Uh, well, we can about I, I, I don't entirely. I'm gonna. I'm going to be a shitty guest here, and I'm going to... <laughs> You're not a guest. You're a co-host. Come on. No, I'm, not, I'm not even... I'm a, I'm a co-host, so I get to do this. So I'm going to challenge you on this. So you, these are the immediate... These are the immediate guys who are, who are getting hurt. I think that in, in the long run, I, I'm not sure who's going to be hurt the most. I mean, these are, these are the guys who are going to really be suffering right now. These are going to be the guys who, you know, are, are, are hurt just because of the pandemic itself and you can't go outside but i think that the economic repercussions um the the companies that you know six months from now a year from now two years from now industries that are going to have a, a hard time getting back to normal i don't think anybody i don't think we know that yet and i think um there are things that we can see now but i think that you know that there, there are going to be a lot of surprises um i, I really sh i think people should kind of expect the unexpected economically um and you know keep keep out keep looking out for for you know big big shifts uh, i think uh we haven't heard of any companies going bankrupt yet and i think you're going to hear about a few of them um and then the larger those companies are and the types of companies that feed into those companies the companies that service those companies we don't know who those companies are and what kind of who are the big you know who are going to be the big losers when airlines start shutting down when restaurants start shutting down when uh you know like uh sporting of it like who are the who are the suppliers um of of uh of the I nba you won't be hearing of these guys because because they're most likely the the smaller people out there uh, here damien says about flyby and, and i think we're going to be seeing several mergers at least on the enterprise side of things uh, hotel chains airlines all these uh, there's definitely going to be mergers happening uh, and these will probably be the ones that we're going to be hearing about um i'm 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 a little bit more pessimistic uh i don't know if there's going to be capital for mergers um it, it really depends on how deep 
and how severe this recession is going to be. Um, I don't think we've experienced anything like this in our lifetimes. I don't know, you know, what this is going to be comparable to, if it's going to be, you know, bigger and longer than, than the Great Recession, or is it going to be more comparable to the Great Depression? Um, I'm, I'm kind of trying to live with both realities as, as an option and trying to figure out who, who are going to be the, the anti-fragile companies, who are going to be the companies and the industries that thrive uh, come almost in, in, in any situation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just, sorry, uh, I was just uh, talking about who's out of the game. Uh, I think we should assume that, that you know, it's all, it's all up for grabs, you know? For sure. Um, I, I do think that one assumption that we can make uh, is that these people are not advertising anymore. Uh, they're not putting in budgets. Even the ones that aren't bankrupt or, or you know anywhere near that, but they're not spending any dollars on advertising, at least not the way they used to. And, and you know that travel as an industry was very uh, aggressive. Uh, it was yeah, it, it's been a great it. it's been a great decade for travel. I mean, at least here in Israel, you had you know open skies. You had you know Tel Aviv. Uh, you see tourists everywhere until until recently, um, and this has been you know the case all over the world with Airbnb um, and, and and the low cost uh, carriers. The world has really opened up, um, so a lot of economic activity has been you know has, has shifted there, and it's um, it's 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 a it's a crash in that sense. Like that's a very very quick crash. For sure, for sure, and I, and I think. My, my next slide kind of depicts this uh, in the best way. This is a, a client of mine that I was working with uh, from the, the travel industry. They, they're dealing with flights. And this is what their graph of revenue looks like in analytics. Uh, it's been slashed by 75%. Uh, this is income coming in from their website, which is their only channel of revenue. Uh, and, and this is what the verge of bankruptcy looks like. This, this is really their, their nightmare. Uh, and there is nothing they can do about this. The, these are flights that are going out of Israel, pretty much. The, these are the only people that are purchasing anything. And, and really, th this is what they're dealing with. And, and they're kind of, you know, with their hands tied in this sense. Um, so, so it's quite yeah. a, a shitstorm there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know who these guys are, but if I were them, the only thing I would say is, you know, figure out how you can stop the bleeding, you know, send everybody on vacation, and then hopefully, 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 things start to get back to normal in two or three months. Um, mm -hmm. But you, know, you kind of have to to bridge it somehow. Uh, Idan is asking if there's a link that he can send people who want to join but haven't registered yet. Is there such a link? Yes, coming up. Cool. Um, it's interesting that it's not completely zero, though. Can you, can you go back? Like, I would expect it could to actually go down to, to zero, but it's not at zero. It's, it's under 1,000. Right. It's not. It's, it's a come down a million, from right. a $2.5 million per week a, to about a, a quarter of that. They're at somewhere nearing $600,000 a month. A week. I mean, that's kind of fascinating that it's not zero. Like people are still. Yes, it's still people that are fleeing from Israel, which is their main kind of a, a base of clients. Um, and I believe that there is still future travel that's being purchased because because there are fantastic deals available now. Still, I think, man, I think that like when this is over, the pent up. I mean, I can't wait to leave the country right now. Like I, you know, tell me I can't do something. And I want to do it just that much more. So, I mean, if people, if there isn't, if people aren't completely wiped out economically by the end of this thing, and if it isn't too long, and if there's somebody, someplace that still exists that you can travel to, I'm sure that Israelis especially, but just people all over there are going to want to, you know, travel a little bit and, and just kind of get out there. Uh, also just, I mean, personally looking at what's happening in Italy, you know, and wondering, you know, oh man, like, is this the end of Florence as we know it, like it makes me want to go to Florence, you know, I want, I want to eat some pasta. Just, it's in the news all the time. And I, you know, I don't know, I, me personally, I'm like, as soon as we can fly, 
I'm pretty sure I'm going to be flying. It, and I think Damien raises a good point because, because, you know, whether or not people will have the financial, you know, capabilities to actually make that kind of purchase and, and travel to Florence or, or whatnot. Um, and, and it's a question of how long and deep this recession is uh, going to be. I do expect there will be a, a boom in flights and kind of inbound or outbound travel for that. Uh, and people will go back to, to purchasing these. Um, how long will it take to, to, for that to happen? It's a good question. But, but I believe it will spike uh, back up. Um, so, so, okay, so, so we know that travel has crashed. And, and I think this is a, a rather trivial in that sense. But we've also seen businesses that continued as usual, right? There's a, there's a flat line here that maybe Gabriel can elaborate a bit more on it. Yeah, this, this is one of my e-commerce clients. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not selling uh, millions of dollars a, a week, but, uh, you know, just a, a few thousand dollars a day. But uh, it's interesting. I mean, this spike that you see has nothing to do with anything. They just ran a sale and it was before the pandemic. But, I mean, they're, they're usually averaging about 3K, uh, 4K, uh, depends on the, the season. Uh, but this quarter has been, you know, it's been relatively slow for them, but it's been flat. I mean, you don't actually see any big difference here. Um, and, and in fact, there, there were a few days when, when things went down and actually conversion rates went down. Um, but most of their traffic is actually from Facebook. And one of the interesting things that's been happening on Facebook is that I, I assume that people are just bored out of their minds at home. And, and buying compulsively out of boredom. Uh, boredom. So no, seriously, like I, I can just imagine people on the couch scrolling through Instagram, like, oh, okay, I'll get this. And like in, in, in just bored. And they're also not leaving the house as much, meaning, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know about your wife, <laughs> but mine has an innate need to shop. And I think when you take that away from her, she's she, she's going to put that energy online. And so, um, and w another interesting thing uh, I've seen is that it's actually it's their regional shifts. So, um, one of the first things I tried when, uh, when when I started to see things kind of not work as well in the U.S. or especially in Europe is uh, I opened up some of the countries in uh, in in Asia that have been faring this thing pretty well. So I opened up Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan. Um, and it's actually, it's been working really well there. Uh, I assume that they're also, they're mostly at home, they're mostly bored, but I think that they're, you know, they're not as freaking out as other countries. Like South Korea, you, you've seen the, the number of cases plateau. Uh, and the number of deaths hasn't really risen as much. So I assume that people aren't freaking out there as much uh, as in other places, and yet they're still at home and they can't really go shopping as much. So, I mean, I think that's one of the main points that, that I think people should, should look at in their campaigns and their activity is that things are happening, like everywhere in the world is, is experiencing a really, really big change mm -hmm. that's really, really immediate, but it's not the same in every place. Uh, how they're experiencing it in Italy isn't how they're experiencing it in Israel and isn't how they're experiencing it in uh, the US or, or in Hong Kong or in China. Uh, so every country is kind of having their own uh, responses to the uh, pandemic. And I think also different cultures deal with, um, deal with fear in different ways. And I think they're also different consumer behaviors. So, I mean, are you somebody who's going to buy even if you don't? Like in the U.S., for example, they live on credit card debt. So even if they're not necessarily making any money, they're, they're probably going to keep spending for a little while. Yeah. And, and I think that ties directly to, to this little research that we've been running at Fixel. We've been trying to understand what has been the, the immediate impact in terms of traffic and engagement on websites. Uh, and, and these are stats for general websites across North America. And, and we've been trying to understand what's been happening. And what we've seen is, is we've had several industries, uh, again, travel, automotive, these uh, that have really crashed in terms of their traffic. Uh, 
And at the same time, the, the overall measurement that we're seeing is risen. We're seeing more traffic coming by websites, and we're seeing more people spending more time online, and some of the, these sites are, are really kind of booming. And, and what's interesting, and I think this kind of goes against what, what you said previously, because people are spending more time online, but, but they're browsing randomly, right? They're spending time on Facebook, they're spending time on news websites, getting you know updated on different kind of death tolls and, and whatnot. Um, but at the end of the day, they're not engaging with content as they have previously. So we're seeing more people coming in, we're seeing less engagement with the actual uh, content, and, and that's our key takeaway. And here, it really calls for you to, to be able to optimize for that traffic and understand really who you want to be working with. Um, and, and I think when we're doing the math here, we have more eyeballs, we have less advertisers. Uh, at the end of the day, this you know drives lower CPMs. Uh, yeah. And I've seen several agencies report CPMs drop by 60, 70%, some of them 50%. And, and it's really a fantastic opportunity. I mean, if you're on the winning side of, of brands that can actually, you know, continue selling online, this is amazing. I mean, this is really striking gold for, for that. Uh, yeah, no, it, there's an opportunity here, absolutely. Um, again, I, I want to kind of hedge that and say, I'm seeing, you know, just talking about comparing March to February, is it's a little problematic. I'm seeing really erratic digital behavior. I'm seeing one thing today, another thing yesterday. Uh, so, you know, things are happening, but I think as different, you know, as things happen, um, I think people are reacting differently. You know, this is, it's a huge social experiment. I don't think that we've ever, I, I don't think that our models are, are, are built for this. You know what I mean? Like comparing one month to another month and looking at just engagement or just CPMs or anything. I feel like that, that's sort of not going to, uh, give us the complete picture just because things are are, are happening really quickly. Um, and so just in terms of, yeah, like the, the CPM thing, I think is, is an opportunity. So, you know, especially if you're advertising on display ads or, or, or if you're advertising on uh, Facebook, for example, like my e-commerce client, there's definitely an, an opportunity there. Like I'm getting a lot cheaper clicks, mm -hmm. even if the conversion rates are a little bit lower, people are, and you know, the, the, the clicks are cheaper. And so if, like if they're half the price and conversion rates are not, you know, uh, haven't fallen by half, you can actually capitalize on that. Um, but I think that the thing I wanted to say that, that's kind of important to remember is, you know, if, if the bottom falls out on the economy, that's not going to, you know, you can get people to the site and you can get people to click, but they're not going to buy anything. Uh, if people are, you know, people are out of, jobs if they haven't you know if they haven't been working for over a month um and and they have to pay rent and they have to you know especially in the u.s pay for for you know uh, health insurance um then then you're not gonna you're not gonna continue to see even if you're in a relatively safe industry and there are opportunities to be out here if you know if the if the economy really goes down the toilet um, it's really going to impact, you know, B2C, B2, uh, B2B, it's really, really going to impact sales. Uh, and you're going to see that, you know, in the non immediately uh, impacted industries, probably in a month or two months as companies start to fall down, uh, as people are, are late on rents, as people's uh, money runs out, ultimately. Money runs out, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, I think also here, here in Israel, we work a lot with startups. Um, that are reliant on venture capital. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's been a really great ride uh, for, for a lot of companies. Uh, money has been really cheap and money is going to continue to be cheap. But I think that people are just not going to be uh, as uh, willing to, to invest uh, over this time. Yes. Uh, and I, I can say as, as you know, a co-founder at a startup, uh, that this is something that we're struggling ourselves. Uh, we were trying to launch our round uh, and really raise some capital, and there is no one you can talk to at this you know point in time. Uh, investors are really refraining from from any new investment, and, and surely when it's something as risky as startup, uh, generally. So 
really it's a difficult time in that sense. Uh, again, you, you got to build yourself, you know, in, in my opinion, to be resilient and be prepared for such times and, and not be reliant on, on external capital in any case. Um, so in any case, we're, we're hoping to, to kind of make it through this uh, rough patch. Um, and I believe it's completely doable, but again, you, you got to kind of cut back on specific things to, to make that happen. Um, so, so let's talk about the winners. Let, let's see who's really been able to kind of capitalize on it. And, and there are some that aren't really, you know, the, the usual suspects for that. Um, so, so one industry we've seen that's been very interesting, uh, financial services. We, we've seen this boom, and this is really, in, in my opinion at least, uh, wasn't expected. Uh, we've seen this on, on credit card companies. We've seen these on banks. Uh, we've seen these on uh, other kind of uh, external uh, financial services. Uh, and it's really driving traffic crazy, and people are moving their money around. So, so I, I think it's very interesting to to look at that. Uh, another is, is all that's happening around computers, personal computers, their peripherals, kind of webcams that are running out from stores, and all that. That's really selling out like mad. Uh, so, so that's a, a fantastic uh, industry that's working there. Uh, streaming, be that music, video, uh, online courses, all that is selling like crazy. I've seen people that are selling online courses for baking cakes or, or you know, everything, digital uh, academies that are happening out there. Uh, and one of the things that uh, maybe shouldn't come as a surprise is uh, all these kits for, for kids. Uh, these crafts and arts and, and all these different things that are uh, made to ship uh, that you know you can do them with your kids when you're in lockdown or, or quarantined home. Uh, so these are selling like crazy. I've heard from one of the agencies I work with that they've sold a month full of their inventory on a single day. In, you, know, you know what? This you know what sort of stands out to me as you are you know laying all this out. I, what, what I think um, I keep thinking back of is, you know, the 2008 recession, it did, you know, the, when, you know, factories uh, fired all their workers um, and then when, you know, things got back to normal uh, after they'd replaced them with robots, they didn't rehire all those guys that they got rid of. And so what I think is happening here is that people are going to be adopting um, digital services and products at a faster rate than than otherwise would have been the case. Uh, so, for example, you know, like you know, e-commerce as a as a as a share of global sales is it's only still about seventeen percent, something like that. So, I mean, and that's for for our generation, that's like weird. Like, I only buy online, right? But or for millennials, it's going to be like they're only buying online. But I think that for older generations. Uh, they haven't been as fast to adapt. And I think that, that you're going to really see more things go online. Uh, I think that you're going to, you know, people are going to, I don't know how long this might not last. Yeah, it might, like by the time this happens, people are just going to want to be outside all the time. But at least during this uh, time, I think when, when people do go back outside, I think that there are going to be certain, if things are more efficient like this or better like this, then they'll stick. But if they're just, you know, if people prefer to work at home, then Zoom will stay, you know, high. But if people actually secretly prefer to work in the office or, or employees prefer that people actually work in the office, then people will be back in the office and the whole, you know, working from home thing will be a flash in the pan. So I don't know, but I think, you know, the, the you're gonna, there are all these digital alternatives. You know, you, you have esports now, right? Esports is a huge industry. It's still, you know, a piss in the bucket uh, versus uh, actual sports uh, mm -hmm. as an industry. But maybe people are going to be like, hey, you know, it's cool to watch other people play Call of Duty or whatever. Um, so I, I'm, I'm guessing that there will be some industries that it just sort of accelerates what, have, what would have been an inevitable dominance of that industry over an older industry. For sure, for sure. 
And, and I guess, you know, ultimately people or, you know, companies don't change unless they're faced with some kind of a actual threat. Yeah. They, they wouldn't push themselves to, to make that kind of change otherwise. Um, Damien mentioned previously, and here this is one of the, the other examples I, I really wanted to show about Blue Apron, right? That they were uh, kind of on a, in a bad trend there. Uh, and, and now with all this kind of happening around the US and everything kind of breaking out, they're hitting it. Uh, yeah. I don't know if all of our, our Israeli audience knows uh, Blue Apron, so maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you should tell people what they, what they do. Sure, go ahead. Oh, okay. So they do uh, um, like meal delivery, but like not of the meals, but like of the stuff to prepare for the meals. Yeah, meal yeah. Uh, I don't think that exists in Israel or anything like that. But basically, they'll give you the raw materials for what you need, like just what you need in order to make the meal, and then you make the meal. Yes. There's a very basic service offered nowadays by uh, Tnuva in Israel, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really far from, from anything Blue Apron provides. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, sweet. Now, I, I've posted a poll here, and I see that we have quite an interesting distribution between in-house and the agency uh, and other marketers, which is also interesting to see people that are coming from, from outside the, the standard kind of uh, mold there. Um, but I think most of the brands we, we've discussed and we've looked at were, were primarily from B2C. And, uh, I'd love to hear your take on, on where B2B brands stand. Well, what's their opportunity with, you know, companies being under great threat and then really kind of people are, are being pushed to, to take all their time off on vacations without being paid and all these different kind of changes that are happening. Can you still market to a B2B company in a, in a B2B scenario? So, um, I mean, like everything else, it's, it's changing daily. Uh, I don't think there's a new normal yet. Uh, but I've been noticing trends myself, um, you know, just with conversations with the clients, uh, but also as a student of other people's ads. Um, there's sort of the obvious stuff. You see a lot of people kind of trying to address, um, you know, the, the, the new pain point of remote work and working from home. That's sort of like the really, really on the on the nose thing. Um, but I mean, it kind of depends on B2B. Like most of my clients are um, B2B software, uh, software as a service and enterprise software companies. Uh, and mm -hmm. generally my feeling is, is that for the most part, they will have a, a, an easier time of it unless they were targeting specifically uh, one of the, the, the hurt industries. So, you know, if, you're, if you were in, a, I don't know, something to do with travel tech, or, or something like that, or, or selling solutions that that deal with you know travel agencies or hotels or something like that. Then you're probably you're probably going to be in big trouble. You're probably hurting. Um, if you are you know selling something pretty standard like a CRM uh, or 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 communications technology or productivity uh, technology, I don't think these are going to be hurt that much. And and the more that you are targeting enterprises. I think the less that you're exposed to risk here because the enterprises, I mean, they'll probably have to cut back and they're, they're probably going to be some, there'll be less deals available, but you know, life will go on and, and these companies have cash usually at hand. Um, so I, I don't think, I think it's actually going to be easier for B2B uh, to survive this than B2C generally. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you can also, you can relatively, I don't know if easily, but you can kind of shift your focus. If you're, you know, if you are a, a marketing technology company and you've mainly been focused in the travel industry, but your solution will work just as well for, um, I don't know, finance, then you can make some adjustments and, and you can target finance uh, in your messaging, in your ads, and in, in your targeting. Uh, it's, it's not easy, right? But I think that it's easier to change a digital project uh, product um, with uh, product tweaks uh, and messaging it is to change a, a physical product and a physical market. Um, so, so, yeah, so I mean, I've, I've been seeing really different uh, approaches. Uh, some B2B companies are, are really trying to jump on this 
uh, with their messaging um, and, and address it head on. Some, some actually are, are benefiting for this. Uh, obviously, Zoom is a B2B company and they're benefiting. Um, but, you know, as I think this, like I said, it, it accelerates that digital transformation that we've been hearing so much about. Um, and, you know, if, if software is eating everything, I think uh, this is the, the situation where software eats everything. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, when it's, when it's the alternative of doing it from your computer uh, or doing it from your phone uh, versus going out and doing it in person, then, then I think that becomes a lot, um, a lot more reasonable all of a sudden to do it um, on your phone. Uh, there also, there's a lot of software that their main benefit is efficiencies and cost cutting, right? So if, you know, you have a software that automates um, some sort of manual process, uh, then I think that that suddenly becomes a lot more interesting as people are cutting back and looking to save money. Uh, so if you have a real benefit, if your product really, really has um, value and is able to really save money for your clients or automate stuff that... Uh, and it also kind of helps people work from remote. So if you have like a Slack, for example, Monday, Asana, I think these things are, are well positioned to, to, uh, to I think these are the, the obvious examples. Mm -hmm. um, and, and here Dor asked the question, and, and you really uh, also said it. If I'm looking at, at Fixel, okay, so we're selling a solution for, for advertisers. Um, at the end of the day, what we're now looking to do is specifically show advertisers we can save them money instead of you know hiring an analyst or if you've laid uh, off your analyst, then, then we can replace it to, again to some extent. Um, so, so that's one thing that we're able to do uh, simply as, as a positioning statement that we're saying that. A, a second thing is... is doing more, uh, I'd say, services for our clients and, and spending more time online with them. Uh, and we understand that our time, uh, me coming from my background and my co-founder, Edgar, coming from his campaign management background, uh, is, is truly valuable for clients, surely, in, you know, in these turbulent kind of times. Um, so, so our offering goes beyond the standard kind of product that we're uh, you know, uh, giving the client, but rather kind of wrapping it uh, in a more, I'd say, holistic manner. Well, I mean, this isn't uh, related to, to anything we've talked about so far, but um, I think it's actually really interesting. Um, the, I think what we're going to see, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's been a sort of souring on uh, Silicon Valley in the last few years. Uh, people have been kind of really anti-Facebook, anti-social networks. Um, and I think I haven't heard any of that during this time. Uh, I think that that sentiment is going to be, um, I don't know if it's going to be rolled back completely, but I think that, you know, people are going to find solace to some degree on social media right now and help on social media right now. Um, you know, if, if once you kind of, you need cooperation from your community. You need to be able to seek out help. I think that Facebook is going to be great for that. Um, and if you can't really leave the home and you need to be in touch with people, that's sort of like what it was for originally. And I don't know, my, 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 my prediction is that actually the, the anti-Silicon Valley sentiment and the anti-social media sentiment is at least going to be put on hold uh, for the time being. So I think I, I, I'd want to use that sentence as, as a segue to bring in uh, Itzik Alfasi, uh, Dr. Itzik Alfasi, because um, he's been doing research on the impact of social networks and, and really how these affect uh, community life and, and the, the different kind of uh, engagement on these networks. We were looking to talk specifically more about a crisis, but I think this really kind of uh, is interesting to, to listen. So Itzik, floor is yours. What, what, what do you say in regards to what Gabby suggested as Facebook being a place to replace uh, these community engagements, these face-to-face -face engagements? Hi, good to be here first. Well, I think this is the question. A lot of people ask, does social media, does uh, social media networks like Facebook and, and Instagram and, and Twitter can replace face-to-face -face interactions? Well, my opinion on that is 
it cannot replace face-to-face -face interaction. If you have a good face-to-face -face interaction, if you have good relationships with your friends, family, um, then Facebook and the other social media networks are very good tools to stay in touch. You can stay in touch with them while they're abroad. You can stay in touch with them uh, if you cannot meet them, like if you cannot meet them like uh, uh, this time. But you cannot really develop a deep and intimate relationship based on social media interactions. That's my yeah, Gabby. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I agree. Um, so, so my question, and, and I think this is originally kind of what we were uh, looking to discuss here, within these kind of times of, of you know, uncertainty and, and this really kind of crisis that's happening out there, are there specific uh, behaviors we can expect or, or specific things that are, you know, top of mind for people? Are, are we really kind of retracting to the bottom of the Maslow pyramid and people are only uh, looking to stack up toilet paper and uh, tahini and whatnot? Uh, or, or can we engage in more meaningful conversation with them? Well, I think that that's a very interesting question. I think that, first of all, there is a difference. Different people in different countries are on different stage, different stages. If we look at the Maslow pyramid, then some people in some countries are really now um, worried about their actual physical existence. So they are like in the first uh, um, level of the pyramid. Other people are now concerned about their security, which is the second level of the pyramid. They're concerned about, uh, about the job, about their financial existence. So this is something that will um, um, occupy them and motivate them. But I think that a lot of people are now at the third stage where the need that motivates them is the need to belong. I think that a time of crisis, a time of uh, stress and distress, people uh, suddenly feel again this need to belong. And we, we are living in a very individualistic era. And I think that people now find again, and not only find, feel again, the need to be connected with others which is interesting and, and strange and, and, and complicated because they always doubt the, the, um, the measure to deal with the pandemic is social distancing. <laughs> so um, so th this, is, this is very interesting. I think that one of the outcomes of this would be that people will find again the importance of having a, a close, having intimate relationship, having relationships, uh, having people in their life that they can uh, trust on them in times of uh, in times of crisis, in times of need. This is the kind of motivation that, that motivates people, psychology, um, in, in this kind of times. So, so I, I think it's interesting. I think one takeaway I uh, can uh, take from this is, is looking at creative. When we're creating ads or creating different kind of, of uh, messaging online, it's, it's how, how we speak and, and the types of visuals that we choose. Is, so, so it wouldn't necessarily be the person, you know, sitting on their laptop alone, but rather within some kind of a group or, right, trying to, to create that more uh, community setting to some extent, again, I believe it's also sorry, sorry, to, sorry. Um, as as you're talking, I was thinking a little bit about um, what you're saying, and 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 one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about: do you, do you think it matters, sort of the the velocity at which people move from one stage to the another? Like you're, you're talking about, you know, people being in an existential uh, state, you know, a state of existential fear. Uh, and, and, and scared for their own um, physical security. And, and sort of like two weeks ago, they were not. It's not like they're, you know, they were in, in uh, I don't know, um, some, uh, third world some third world country and, and really scrounging for, for their next meal. Uh, and then, you know, this pandemic hit and, you know, they went from bad to worse. You have people in, in some of the richest countries in the world that, you know, they have pensions and their, their, their life, for so far has been pretty, pretty, pretty sweet. And now all of a sudden everything 
has gone to shit. And I'm, I'm curious if, if that, if the velocity of change has any sort of um, impact here. And, and if it can, it, it, I guess, I mean, my, I'm, I don't know if this is a, a question or, or an assumption, but like if there's, I, I assume the longer that the situation is like this in terms of the, the quarantine and people social distancing, then the more permanent the changes might be. Uh, you know, if it, if it ends tomorrow, I think we'll kind of go back to our individualistic ways quite soon. Um, and if it if it lasts with us for for six months, there, there are probably going to be some pretty deep cultural changes. So, I mean, how do you how do you see that? Um, it, it's a very interesting point that you are raising. I, I will I will uh, first of all uh, um, um, answer what Elad uh, uh, asked about um, how to market things uh, uh, at this time and I, I don't know if I can uh, if I will be able to share my screen because I saw some um, I saw this ad you can see that you you can share your screen you have a button there with two kind of the uh, squares at the bottom of the screen you can click on Okay, I think it's working. Yes. You can see the ad? No. Yeah, now we see it. Yeah. Okay, so I saw this ad on my, uh, uh, on my uh, Facebook uh, uh, feed, and I thought this is a very good one because they are now saying to people, you are not alone. We will come through this together. It's not looking like they're trying to take advantage of the situation. I think that marketers uh, should think now how they communicate to people that they are with them, that they're not trying to take ad uh, advantage, financial advantage of the situation, but they are trying to support them. And, and I think they, they're trying to be sympathetic. And I think this ad is, uh, uh, is, a, very good, is a very good example. Um, it relates to what what will be in the uh, in the in the near future about how people uh, feel and what would be their uh, uh, the motivations. Um, I think it depends on what what's uh, what is going on with the pandemic. I mean, like we don't know. I mean, like it changes from from from, from day to day. Um, if we take this Maslow pyramid model, then you can go up and down the levels and quite fast and uh, and quite easily. Um, I think that uh, once it uh, um, once the pandemic uh, is being contained, people will start to feel uh, more relieved and more secured, and maybe we'll see um, uh, some sort of a shift high in terms of of buying uh, uh, and consuming uh, things. Some sort of uh, uh, of a counter reaction to uh, counter reaction to the anxiety that they are uh, feeling right now. Yeah, I, I have a little bit more of a cynical output on it. I think um, in in B two B specifically, uh, a lot of the time we we, we, talk, in, we talk in terms of pain points, um, and almost always. And I wish this wasn't the case. I wish we could just run great ads based on uh, you know, this is an awesome product and you should get it. Um, but but what seems to work is is addressing a, a specific pain point. So. You know, we're not selling the the solution. We're we're selling the problem uh, in B two B a lot, and that's usually what works um, for whatever reason. Uh, and it's it's been the case for for some time. And so, what I've been seeing and what I've been noticing is that in in this kind of environment, um, the 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 job to be done, so to speak. That you know, if you're a marketer, then then you have certain problems, you have certain pains. Um, a lot and I are familiar with that. You have problems of data, you have problems of targeting, you have problems of uh, organization, you have problems of creative. And, and these are all problems that, you know, you have on your job. And uh, generally what I've found over time is that when, when you address the problem and you say, you know, this isn't going to be a problem for you anymore when you use our software and you don't really talk about necessarily the software, you just talk about how we're going to solve your problem that seems to work more. And what I've been trying to get across as much as I can is that people's pain points have, have changed really quickly overnight. Uh, and that's never the case that people's, you know, 
pain points. And maybe when they change jobs or they change locations. Uh, so people's pain points, people, what are bothering, what's bothering people, what concerns people has, has changed literally uh, in the course of a week. And so if you are, uh, I don't know, you're an accountant at a, uh, an enterprise company, um, you had uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, very specific and very predictable problems. Um, and that, you know, companies could, could learn and adjust and optimize how to address that. Marketers could address that pretty, pretty predictably. Uh, what I think that we're going to be seeing now is that people's, people's pain points are, are, are different. And I think the most obvious one that I've been seeing, and we're going to be talking about ads pretty quickly, um, is, you know, talking about remote work. So if you're an accountant and now you're working from home, um, your biggest problem is getting people to send their expenses, you know, from home, or your biggest problem is how can you actually work from home without your kids coming into the, the, the camera? Um, maybe you need new software. Maybe you've been working on some sort of legacy software, uh, for the last 20 years, but that's not going to, that's going to not going to cut it right now, uh, with, uh, with your, uh, at home set setup. And now's the time that you're going to be reevaluating just like new parents are reevaluating their expenses and, and the brands that they love. Uh, I think that people, when people go through a big change in their lives, I think your brain is now open to possibilities that they wouldn't have been open to. And, and you have new problems. And I think that's kind of the biggest and most interesting challenge that we have now as B2B marketers is, uh, is, is finding out what their new challenges are beyond the immediate stuff, but like their business challenges and trying to figure out, you know, how can you, how can you fit that? It's, I think it's not just marketers as well. It's, it's products. I believe that over the next few years, you're going to, you're going to see new products come out uh, and address these new problems in new ways. That's it. I think we lost a lot. Yeah, I think we lost a lot. <laughs> Hope everything is okay. And uh, I think you're raising a very good point. I think that we need to distinguish with, between uh, people who can sell things that are now um, um, needed. <laughs> people who sell yeah. alcohol gel or people who sell yeah. masks, they can make a lot of profits right now. But people... Who divorce sell, lawyers? Divorce lawyers are going to be... Uh, yeah. Yeah. And people who say you talked earlier about online courses and other stuff, so people can take use uh, take take this uh, you take you take uh, use this uh, crisis as uh, as an opportunity. Crisis is always an opportunity for someone, and and I and you can see people. I am as a consumer, you can uh, can see people who try to take advantage of it. But if you're selling something that is not relevant, if you're saying uh, uh, something that uh, um, um, you need to go, if, if you are a restaurant, uh, so maybe you can, you can sell takeaway. But I mean, like maybe you cannot uh, do uh, um, uh, uh, um, takeaways. And if you sell things that people need to go out of their homes to buy. Um, so what do you do? And, and this this is a challenge for you, as, as you said. So we need to distinguish between two uh, these two uh, uh, things. Yeah, uh, Elad, are you still with us? I'm back. Welcome back. So, uh, <laughs> lost you to the, you lost you to the corona there. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. So uh, thank you, Itzik. I, th I think that was fascinating and at, and at least you know that that gave me a, a good kind of perspective as a marketer on, on really how to to try and address this and and really i wanna i i, I would want to continue but i wouldn't want to to kind of make this run too long i think i'm going to use up the last two minutes to kind of breathe through some interesting ads that gabby and i have seen over the past week uh, and really kind of are a uh, two cents on a uh, on these Gabby you ready so I think this is the the first one uh, that's been interesting we've seen Salesforce uh, that's really right, hold on before we do that Noah has a question here uh, I'm gonna mm -hmm. share it with the class sure um, so yes, guys, should a business spend more money on Google PPC or less during this time? I know it is a broad question, but basically if we have analyzed keywords, use would you recommend it? So I think, I mean, obviously it's going to depend. Uh, what I think, 
<laughs> what I think uh, is really going to, two things you need to think about. One, your keyword research, you can throw it out the window. Like it's, it's over. There's what was, you know, what was happening a month ago is not happening right now. You're going to have increased uh, demand, decreased demand. If what you are, you know, if what people are searching for and you have something relevant for that, then, then absolutely you should be spending more on Google. Um, if people are, you know, if you have a product that is going to be in, um, in actual increased demand right now, uh, then yeah, you should be spending more on that. You should capitalize on that while it's available. If, um, I mean, even if demand is down, but that's, you know, what you're doing and it's not more expensive, then, then yeah, you should be, you should be running on it. Any additional Salesforce. questions, yes. shoot us out in the chat. Uh, so first ad, Salesforce, they don't seem to give a rat's ass about Corona happening. You know, they're pitching it. Uh, it's uh, interesting. I, I only, okay, so some of these, you, you included some of these and I included some of these. I only included the ones that are specifically referencing Corona. Th this, so. this to me was interesting because they've completely ignored any mention of so, I mean, my guess here, and I've been seeing a lot of that. I think a lot of these uh, campaigns, I think a lot of people are paralyzed by fear. Uh, and I think the larger the company, I've, I've seen the larger the enterprise is, the less they've kind of shifted it, to talk about to steer a juggernaut, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I think they haven't had that difficult conversation yet about budgets and about for targeting, sure. about messaging, and they just haven't adjusted yet. For sure. Uh, so I, I actually, I didn't necessarily get all of these ads, uh, I looked at, um, I went to look for uh, ads that I thought might be interesting. So Trello, they have, you know, they have a, a, a productivity app, a competitor of Monday, of, of Asana, of uh, Basecamp. Um, so I, I saw a lot of ads from these guys that are talking about working from home. So they're, you know, they're going all in on the working from home angle, uh, Slack. Same thing, you know, uh, join us for a webinar and working remotely on Slack. Uh, Gong is talking about working from home. Uh, Monday is talking about working from home. Right. So, I mean, these are the new companies aspects, that, right? These, it, it doesn't surprise me that any of these are kind of pushing these messages out there. Sure. So, so um, but I think, I mean, it's not just that it's not surprising. It's that they have, I mean, it's, it's one, it shows to their strength as startups uh, that they've managed right. to create uh, creative, turn it around and create all new campaigns and ads probably within the course of a week. Mm -hmm. um, most of these guys actually checked them already last week and none of these ads were up last week. Mm -hmm. So these are all really quick uh, responses. So I think, I guess the, uh, the first advice here would be be fast. Um, if you don't have the resources to be very, very fast, then you know create resources that you can kind of shift as you need to be. Um, so right now, everybody's talking about work from home, you know, maybe two, two months from now or two weeks from now, it's going to be different things about, you know, dealing with the economic fallout or dealing with lack of capital or dealing with this or dealing with that, mm -hmm. dealing with being unemployed or dealing with, uh, hiring new people. So I think, uh, just being able to quickly respond to, uh, unfolding events is going to be crucial in these days. For sure. And work from home, another example. Yeah. What's interesting here is this is not a usual suspect. Um, you know, Perimeter 81, they're a, a, you know, they're, they're a cybersecurity company. Uh, and so they're just, I think they're not like, they don't have a specific solution for that. But I think that they're just trying to adjust their marketing uh, accordingly uh, to, to the situation. Obviously, they do have, there are security problems that arise from remote working and they're talking about that, but their solution isn't specifically about that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's just interesting to say, like, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to have a, a service that specifically caters to uh, remote work. You just have to think, you know, how is this, what's going to be interesting to my audience right now? What are people worried about? This is another interesting example from an online agency. A, most agencies have suffered deeply from, you know, all marketing budgets being cut back. Uh, and these guys shifted, right? You have your event canceled. Let's do an online event. We'll do it for you. We'll produce, we'll promote, we'll do everything. So it's interesting to see a change of offering uh, from an agency, from ones that have suffered uh, from this kind of pandemic happening. Um, 
And I think this is the one that's been chasing me around Facebook uh, longest, uh, partially because I'm the Martha Stewart of the ho home. Um, these guys, uh, these are Israeli uh, uh, textile company that they're selling uh, all these different kind of uh, things from, from these, uh, what am I call it? Uh, 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 bedroom sheets and, and uh, other accessories for home. And, and oh, yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So, so they've been stuck with things that they aren't able to, to export. Uh, so they've been selling these at really floor prices, and it's, it's amazing. And they, they've been chasing me around on Facebook for the past couple of weeks. Uh, and, and this is really, you know, making that lemonade from a lemon. I think this is a fantastic example of a standard business that's really trying to change the way that they're uh, capitalizing on this event. Uh, and last but not least, Gabby, this is your example. Yeah, th this is one that actually I just I saw this today, and I just you know it stood out to me. Uh, I, I can't really say if this is good or bad. Um, they they seem to have some sort of uh, solution uh, for uh, virtual signatures or, or digital signatures, and it, it's not a, a you know a usual suspect here. But I guess they're saying, okay, what can we do about this? The fact that they put the guy in the gas mask. Uh, I don't know. Sucked, but yeah. I mean, it, it obviously caught my attention, um, and so I guess I guess they're doing something right. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the fact that they they write here, um, so that signs documents sterile and secure. So <laughs> everything you can wish it's, it's for currently. Yeah, it's kind of the best case scenario: sterile and secure. <laughs> Cool. So I, I think that's a wrap. Uh, and thank you for everybody that attended and uh, stayed the full length of this. Uh, Good for a show, man. Good for a show. It was very interesting for me. I've, I've learned a lot from this uh, kind of conversation with you and with Itzik. And uh, yeah. going forward, I was also happy that you learned a lot from me. Going forward, we'll have this uh, weekly until the pan pandemic dies out or the zombies eat us up uh, alive. So thank you, guys. And uh, we'll share a link with the deck and everything. And, uh, I want to ask everybody uh, who's still paying attention, uh, would you guys like this to be a weekly show? Um, things are happening all the time. We're seeing different things all the time. Uh, are you guys, would, would you guys like to tune in uh, once a week or is that overkill? You know, it says yes. Anybody else? Rock and roll. Yes. All right. Two is a crowd. Three people. Yala. I think uh, we, we've got a hit on our hands. We're going mainstream. Cool. See you guys. Bye, guys. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay uh, stay healthy. Social distancing. And uh, use AquaGel. This show is brought to you by AquaGel.